So now moving on to what does the Bible actually tell us about spiritual warfare in the sections that the Bible does talk about spiritual warfare. And one of the points uh, that we need to understand that the Bible very explicitly tells us is that we must be aware of the battle. Now this seems very obvious to many people, but uh, you need to understand that this, is, this isn't as obvious as it sounds. Um, where many Christians nowadays might believe in God, um, some people to a greater or lesser extent, even within people who would um, profess themselves to be Christians, many of them actually haven't thought about or outright don't believe in Satan. Now you think like, what does that have to do with anything? But not believing in Satan gives you a very different picture of what Christianity is about. If, if you were just to think about the gospel or the entirety of scripture and take out the enemy, take out Satan uh, from the entirety of scripture, the kind of narrative that you would get would be maybe one where, you know, you get saved and you become a better person and you are better equipped to help people along and maybe there's social justice uh, causes and maybe there's a lot of different things that you could do, but there's no sense of combat, of battle. There's no sense of there's actually an enemy doing everything in his power to work against you and it's actually a wrestling match. Um, and in one of the passages from Old Testament, there's a part where uh, someone who was previously blind to uh, this dynamic of a, a combat happening was their eyes were open, and this comes from Second Kings. This is where Elisha is there with his um, servant, and he is, sur and they are all of a sudden surrounded by enemy forces from the king. So this is kind of like coming into it, into the middle of the story. Uh, but from verse 13 to 17 of chapter uh, 6 of Second Kings, it says, Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. So then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. So y actual forces, actual armies surrounded the city looking for Elisha. And when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early uh, the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And this is what the prophet said. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? You, don't you see this, this army surrounding us? And so Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So this is a moment in Scripture where we're just reading this narrative in Old Testament Scripture, and we're like, okay, now there's going to be another of the many battles. And then we get this glimpse that there's something much deeper going on than what we actually see in the natural. And with this prayer, of, of Elisha asking his, for his servant's eyes to be opened, there's a new dimension that is actually opened up. It's almost like the veil comes up just for a second, just long enough for the servant to see. And this gives us a glimpse into something that is happening all the time, but we only get a glimpse of it here and there. So this is one of the many times in scripture where this happens. And many times, especially in modern Christianity, we tend to minimize a lot of the supernatural dynamics of the Bible. You know, things like, you know, miracles happening or floods or plagues or punishments or angels. All these things are part of scripture. And this is something actually that happened in history. And many times we tend to either over-spiritualize it or neglect it altogether. So... That to, all that to say, we must be aware of the battle. It's very easy, especially nowadays, to live decades of your life as a Christian and be completely unaware of a battle that is going on. And the Bible doesn't make an allowance for us to do that. Second is we must have the proper perspective. We must have proper perspective of the battle. One of the dangers of talking about spiritual warfare is that you can overemphasize it or you can underemphasize it. So just now we were talking about the underemphasis of it. If we don't talk about it at all, 
our Christianity and our journey with the Lord and what we're called to do and how we're called to impact the nations, it is greatly minimized. It's almost like a, like we're cut at the knees in what we're able to do if we don't talk about spiritual warfare at all. But now that we do talk about it, we must have proper perspective of the battle. The danger of, for example, overemphasizing spiritual warfare is that you can become very unbalanced in your view of it as well. I don't know if you have ever encountered people like this who perhaps they are over, um, what's the word? like almost like too oversensitive, too over aware, hyper aware of something that is going on where it doesn't allow them to actually ground them in what's happening in the natural as well. Or I don't know if you've heard if, you know, like you're talking about, uh, you know, you're counseling somebody through a problem or they're talking about something that happened in their life and um, then their solution is like, this is a sp spirit of, mm. and you're like, no, actually, I think you just handled that, that conflict really badly. <laughs> like, you shouldn't have worded things that way. You know what I mean? Like, when it can be actually something with a very natural cause, and it's something a lot more straightforward than it comes out to be, sometimes we can over-spiritualize things and call this or that, you know, call everything a, a spirit of something or a demon of something or another. And we don't want to do that either. And the problem, the main problem with that is that you're giving too much of a spotlight to what the enemy is able to do. Now, when we talk about the spiritual, uh, when we talk about spiritual warfare, we must always start out from a place of understanding where we sit and where we stand as people of God. Now, in Romans eight, there's you know the the final passage from Romans eight. It talks about where believers stand regarding all the attacks of the enemy, and this is what it says. This is what Paul says through Romans. Uh, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed is interceding for us. So we are not just seated with him, but we're also being interceded for. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered, but no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, another translation for that is demons or principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this should establish us in a place of confidence and understanding who we are in God's sight. If we don't start from that place and we begin to talk about spiritual warfare, we can come to a place where we are teetering on, the, on this kind of like uncertainty of like, do I have what it takes? Or who will win at the end? Or do, uh, you know, what's gonna happen after all this happens? There's this uncertainty that we're not called to take part in when we're talking about spiritual warfare. And many of us kind of edge away from the whole topic of spiritual warfare because of this. We're like, well, if we start thinking about these things, where well, more things happen. It's almost like saying Beetlejuice, you know? Like, if you say it, like, will it happen? We're like, will it invoke these things upon your life or something? But the Bible is saying not only should you be aware of it, you should know how to engage in it, and you should be firm in where you stand. You should know that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. And that's the only way that you can engage in spiritual warfare. So one more time, we should be aware of the battle. We must almost also have a uh, proper perspective of the battle. And third, uh, we must be willing to engage in the battle. We must be willing to engage. It's one thing to know, and we can store up all kinds of knowledge about this. There's people who can study this all their lives, and they can write books about this. But if they don't actually engage in spiritual warfare, there's very little uh, that they can do in the actual uh, war. So uh, one passage that I thought about was um, the passage in the book of Daniel. So Daniel was uh, someone who walked in the counsel of the Lord, and he was somebody who engaged in spiritual warfare, and he did not, he, he did not, um, what's the word, rescind? Like, like give up that, uh, that opportunity to engage or leave that to somebody else. Uh, this is kind of a, a longer passage, but... Uh, 
stay with me. In the third day of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called, its, image, its, its message was true and it concerned a great war. Uh, the understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. Mourning meaning fasting. He fasted for three weeks. This is, was a 21-day fast. I ate no choice food, uh, no, meat wa- uh, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. I guess that was part of his fasting <laughs> consecration. <laughs> no lotions. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the 20, please, if you're fasting, please use your lotions. Um, <laughs> On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ufaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. So this is an angel that appears before him. This is after he's been fasting for three weeks. And then we move on uh, a, a few lines, and it says, uh, I, Daniel, was, not the only one, uh, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. So this is a messenger of God that was sent to him. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. So since the first day, It wasn't after 21 days of fasting that anything was mobilized. It was after the first day where he set, you know, he set his mind to gain understanding and began to fast and pray. That was when things were mobilized in the heavens. But the prince of of the Persian kingdom resisted, this meaning a principality. The prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, so this one of the chief archangels uh, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So this is a very, very mysterious kind of passage in the Old Testament. And you're like, what in the world is he talking about? Is this like fasting brain? Like he's talking about a prince of Persia and then this Michael guy and like what is happening here he's basically given a glimpse into uh what is happening in the spirit what is happening uh as he's been praying and fasting and this is what the angel tells him when the the first day that you started to pray and fast that's when I was deployed and for the 21 days that you were actually fasting and praying you thought that maybe nothing was moving you thought that, that maybe something was taking, like God was taking very long. But during that entire 21 days where you're fasting and praying and seeking the Lord, that's when I was battling, that's when I was battling the prince of the Persian kingdom. So that's when he was battling a principality. So there was a clash in the heavens that was happening as he was praying and fasting. So this is giving you a glimpse of something very real that happens as a response to something that we can do in the natural. Does that make sense? So spiritual warfare is real. And when you think that nothing happens when you're fasting and praying, that is a complete lie of the enemy. Things are moving and shifting in the heavens. Angels are deployed. Battles are taking place. All these things are happening as you're fasting and praying. And sometimes it takes faith for us to do that. Sometimes when we're in day one, day four, day seven, you're like, nothing is happening. I'm not hearing from the Lord. No breakthroughs happening. What is going on, Lord? Do you not hear my prayers? And during this entire time, things are happening. Things are moving. But sometimes we don't see it but this is all happening as a result of prayer. So spiritual warfare is happening as a result uh, of us being willing to engage in the battle in the same way that Daniel did. And lastly, uh, we must be confident in the outcome of the battle. That kind of touches on where we stand, you know, as believers. We must be confident in the outcome of the battle. It would be terrible if the Bible ended not at Revelation, but somewhere else, you know, <laughs> like a, a, f- a few books before that. 
And we didn't get a glimpse of how s- the story actually ends. But we were actually given the privilege of knowing actually the ending, even before it's actually happened. It's like spoiler alert. We're we're given we're already you know the, we already know exactly where this is going, and yet many of us still are like I don't really know what's going to happen. Like I th- anything you know anything could happen from from here. Like maybe the devil will win, or maybe this will happen. Maybe the um, you know the saints will not prevail. Uh, and there's such unnecessary uncertainty when it comes to how what the outcome of the battle is. But it's very clear in Revelation uh, 20. Uh, Revelation 20 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, and he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So it's like, the devil is down. It's game over, but there's going to be a little comeback. And so you're like, okay, maybe there is, it's an open-ended kind of story. But no, we, we go on to a few, uh, a few verses down uh, that same chapter, and it says, um, and when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them, don't worry about Gog and Magog, to <laughs> gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plains of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, meaning Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And they lived happily ever after. That's basically how the story ends. So there is no mystery to that. When it comes to engaging in spiritual warfare, we must know that God has to overcome. He will overcome. That's how the story ends. So that's going to place us, that's going to set our feet in a very firm foundation where we're not shaken by any of the attacks of the enemy and we're not intimidated by anything that the enemy throws our way in the meantime. Does that make sense? All this matters tremendously when we talk about spiritual warfare. Without these foundations, we get we can become very weird Christians. We can, everything will become about like, I don't know if the devil's going to win this one or, you know, it becomes like just a kind of weird Christianity. But when we have that revelation of we know exactly who we are, we know exactly how the story ends, and we've been given everything that we need for this victory, uh, then there is no uncertainty when it comes to that. 